Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here this evening. I'm Chris Cook, the Executive Director of the Venus Center, and it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this evening's art talk for the exhibition, I Let Them In, Conditional Hospitality and the Stranger. This exhibition, which unfolds in our two front galleries and our, our video room, features video works by Kader Atia and Candice Streets. And the exhibition is organized by Tarane Mazzelli. And uh, Tarane is our 2018 Curator in Residence. Uh, now in its second year, the Curator Residence Program uh, allows Bemis to diversify its curatorial voice by inviting independent curators to have funded residencies and to curate exhibitions here at the Bemis. This program is possible through the generous support of Carol Gindler, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts. I would also like to recognize Omaha States and Security National Bank for underwriting the exhibition itself. And before handing over to, to Tarane and to Rachel, who, Rachel Adams, for those of you that have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, she is the organization's new chief curator and director of programs. Uh, this is her first public event, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so I want to uh, recognize their tremendous efforts in pulling together this exhibition but also the work of the entire staff and board of the Bemis that uh, work feverishly to make exhibitions like our current one come together and to ensure that um, our programming like tonight uh, remains free and accessible to our audiences. So thank you again for being here tonight and without further ado, I'll hand it over to Rachel. Thank you. I am thrilled to see all of you here. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, Tarane, I want to say special thanks to you for curating this show and for all of the work that you've done at the Venus all year. Um, and we're really just thrilled with it. Um, we are going to start um, and we're just going to have a conversation. We have some questions that I'm going to be asking Tarane, but then we're going to definitely open it up to the audience. So we really hope that. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask, please feel free. We'll have the microphone. We'll go around when that happens. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I just want to echo Chris's thanks to the whole staff and board. Um, particularly, um, I think, as some of you may know, we're looking for an exhibitions manager right now. So, um, bulk of my shows have been all staff efforts. Um, particularly, uh, Davina. Madison, um, Alan, who I don't think is here, um, but also especially Josh um, and Rachel for helping get this show off the ground. It wouldn't have happened without you, and I really appreciate it. Um, and also, just as we get started, um, I'd just like us to take a moment to recognize the site the Bemis is on was the territory of the um Umanhong, Tonka, Pawnee, Otwe, Missouri, and Owe peoples. So the Umanhong tribe in 1854 was led to believe that they were securing U.S. protection by signing a treaty and giving up their land, and now makes up the city of Omaha. Um, so this directly ties into some of the conversations we'll have today about hospitality and um, considering who is the guest. Um, so I just wanted to recognize that. And also, um, I have a bit of a stomach bug, so just <laughs> forgive me if I need to repeat something and just ask questions if I don't make sense. Same, also. We're just, we're <laughs> <there. Same. laughs> Uh, okay, so we're just going to get started. Um, can you tell us how the show originally developed? Yeah, um, so when I first came, I was going to do three shows, so I ended up doing two. And um, the three shows that I had conceived of, they were kind of uh, cumulative. So the first show was the sick time show that happened in the spring. Um, and in that, I was really investigating many things around the politics of health, but care. So this show, um, we'll get into it, but addresses hospitality. Um, but also, uh, I think I was trying to build on what has already been done here. So I'm the second curator in residence, and Risa Puello, uh, this time last year, curated um, 
It's a massive group exhibition, I think 35 artists. Um, the, sh the show is called Monarchs. Um, and it showcases the work of a lot of immigrant and indigenous artists dealing with um, mobility and displacement. So I wanted to do something that kind of built on that and I wanted to directly um, um, also address um, some of the Mrs. White viewers and their implication in that process. Great. Um, and Monarchs is currently going to be traveling to the Nerman Museum in case you want to see it again. <laughs> um, so I think what might be interesting for people to learn about is sort of the central investigation you're talking about hospitality and the stranger. Um, can you kind of expand on, on that theme? Yeah, so the central, um, we'll get into it through some of the works, but the central investigation of the show um, is the aesthetic codes and uh, systems that govern our understanding of the other. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this term, the other could also be interchangeable with the stranger, the alien, the foreigner. The other, um, it really means someone who is excluded from so-called normal groups. Um, and the term emerges from different um, post-colonial and race theories. Um, um, so let's talk a little bit about the artists that are in the show. We have Candice Breeds and Cotter Atia. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Candice, um, who she is, how the work in I Let Them In sort of fits in her larger artistic practice? Yeah, um, so uh, Candice is, uh, she's a white South African who lives um, in Berlin now. And a lot of her work um, over the years has dealt with um, how popular media, and particularly Hollywood films, shapes our sense of self in relation to a larger community or society. So she's worked with a lot with actors. So there's a really famous piece of hers with Meryl Streep. Um, yeah, so she's basically looking at how this media shapes our sense of self and attention economies. Uh, so the piece that's in the show is called Love Story, um, which she made in 2017, I believe. Um, can you talk about how it got made? It's obviously very, I don't want to say Hollywood production, um, but like there's a lot of production around it. Maybe you can talk about um, that and sort of her impetus for making this really specific work. Yeah. Um, so while the I think the the date of the work is 2017, I believe it was several years that she was both actually both her and Potter's piece um, was filmed over the span of a couple years. So I think it was the summer of 2015 when she started it, if I remember correctly. I'm really bad. Um, but as I mentioned, she lives in Berlin and Germany has been taking in a lot of refugees. Um, and so there was, a, um, that summer, there particularly was a lot of violence against refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and there's also been the rise of the right wing there. Um, so anti-refugee um, anti rhetoric was very high. And so I think she was very compelled um, how she could use her work to draw attention to this. Um, yeah, and so she ended up uh, meeting with six different individual asylum seekers and interviewing them at length. Um, I believe she had hundreds of hours of interviews. Um, yeah, and she interviewed them. So there's three women, three men, uh, and two of them were in Cape Town, two of them were in New York City, and two of them were in Berlin. Those were the cities where they were seeking asylum. Um, and yeah, the, they were in exile, um, not by choice, and for all very different reasons. Um, so for those of you, have, some of you presumably have had a chance to look at the piece, some of you haven't yet. Um, but you will see all of those interviews at length in the second room of the installation. So just a note, when you come in, um, if you turn right, um, the first room, um, you enter in for a little black curtain. And then you, you see the first part of the piece, and then you enter into the second um, part, and you have to actually exit back out the way that you came in. Um, yeah. um, maybe can you talk about um, a little bit about the installation? I think that would, you know, like why she decided to make it the way that she did. Yeah, so um, I guess as I was saying, these, these people are in exile for very, very different reasons. Um, three women, three men. Um, some of them were persecution due to their sexuality, their religion, um, political conflict, war. Um, and what she did is she, it's a very intentional installation. Um, so I guess that's why I mentioned that. Um, so if you've walked in, you've seen that there's, um, there's a single channel video in the first room. And it has two very well-known faces that 
many of you may be familiar with because they're two Hollywood actors, Alec Baldwin and Julianne Moore. And so after doing these interviews, what Candice did is she created, um, ex using excerpts from the interviews, a script that she asked these actors to work with her on. And so the, that video is actually about 72 minutes, so notably the length of a feature length film. Um, and she's very intentionally employing this provocative gesture to make us think about whose stories we are um, most compelled by and who we're willing to listen to. Um, and if you watch, um, basically there's certain kinds of archetypes and tropes um, of atrocity and victimhood that emerge. Um, but then you also watch, and um, I know Julianne Moore for years has compelled me, and if you watch, there actually is a real consideration um, of attention in her craft that makes you kind of feel emotion and be compelled. Um, so I think it's a complicated dynamic. Um, uh, who was I speaking to? Someone, we were just speaking about how it's up at um, um, MFA in Boston, and there was just a review in the Boston Globe that said, you know, this, this gesture is a scold of sorts. Um, she's very much thinking about kind of codes of whiteness and how they function in media, but it's so much more than a scold. It's trying to make us think about, you know, how we absorb stories in our culture. Um, let's move on to the other artist that's in the show, and then we can kind of wrap back around. Um, so the other artist is Kader Akia. Um, can you tell us a little bit about him and uh, his background, his work, and how that sort of fits into this exhibition? Yeah, um, so this piece is not actually, um, I, I saw both um, Candice's and Cotter's work in Venice this summer, um, and Cotter's work I've been following for some time. Um, he's French Algerian, um, and he lives between um, Paris and Berlin, um, and he, his work very much deals with um, what he calls repair, um, and repair in the wake of colonization. So being, um, being raised in Algeria and then moving to France. Um, uh, so while all the, the, the two works in the show are video, um, his practice comprises all kinds, kinds of medium. Candice particularly works in video. He works um, video, performance, archival installations, um, photography, sculpture, um, some very whimsical and poetic, some more, you know, you'll see this, this piece is, um, you know, full of talking head entities, as you like to call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think while his approach is very diverse, it's all united under this um, concept of repair. So for something close to 20 years, he's been investigating what repair means. Um, and he sees a kind of trilogy, he sees reappropriation, repair and reparation. But basically, just like to be really succinct about it, he sees um, repair, um, different conceptions of repair in the West and non-Western um, countries. So the idea in the West, it would be to repair to an intact state, um, to remove the wound, where, um, uh, and particularly in traditional non-Western countries, there's a sense of um, valuing the scar and the traces. Um, and so one example he gives of this is a um, traditional form of Japanese ceremonial pottery. Um, so in these pots, um, when there's a crack, they're repaired with very visible gold sutures. Um, so he's looking at different kinds of visual cultures when he's developed this and, and practices. Uh, so he has two pieces in this exhibition. Um, the first one, Reasons Oxymoron, is um, the larger installation um, with the eight videos. Um, and as you mentioned, the talking heads. So um, can you talk about who are being, who are being interviewed, um, what they're addressing, and also why it's installed the way that it is? Yeah, sure. Um, so I should say when I you know, mentioned that the show is really about kind of these systems of representation and meaning that govern our understanding of the other, obviously it's very much looking at the so-called mi um, migration crisis and the figure of the refugee, particularly in Candice's work. But in Cotter's, um, I mean, I think he's looking at it a bit more expansively, and what he's done, so he conducted these interviews, um, like I mentioned, over the course of two years, between Africa and Europe, um, and he was really looking at how different conceptions of healing around trauma, and trauma, particularly in the wake of colonization, globalization, um, and displacement. Um, so he's interviewed a, um, a number of people 
um, really like there's a focus on psychiatry and psychoanalysis, but also history, um, political theory, uh, uh, like music, musical ethnologists, um, and the piece has been shown before, and when it was shown before, it had 18 chapters. In this case, we were showing the eight that most deal with the kind of um, um, effects of assimilation and displacement. Um, so, like, um, they're organized in these chapters, um, like uh, exile, language, genocide. Um, yeah, and they're installed in this. Like, if you walk in, you're like, oh, Venus offices have expanded into the gallery. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I think uh, this kind of the, the cubicle as this kind of like symbol for bureaucratic maze. And so he's really referencing, you know, these kinds of um, different frameworks for dealing with trauma, um, the bureaucracy of science and psychiatry. Um, but in this work, he's very particularly looking at like different systems of meaning um, and understanding self and the communal between Western countries and traditional non-Western countries. And so therefore, it's, you know, the effects of assimilation become from a non, uh, from the traditional non-Western country to a Western country that allows you to understand that better. And the chairs are very comfortable. Uh, and then finally, in our video room, we have Cotter's uh, single channel video uh, called Prosody, which is the culmination uh, of the exhibition. Why, do you want to talk about this work a little bit and then also why you chose it to sort of be the ending point? Yeah, so um, uh, this was the piece of his that I saw in Venice and when you go to these large art exhibitions, often you like can't see anything anymore because you have a very short period of time and you've seen so much art. And I have to admit to being a kind of disenchanted art viewer sometimes where you just like, you know, you've like seen a lot of things and you don't let it affect you. And that piece literally moved me to tears. Um, and I think, I really thought it would have an interesting relationship, um, particularly to Candice's work, not just in kind of um, these conditions that it's addressing, but this idea of interviews and storytelling. And I think Candice's work is very much looking at the limits of empathy, um, whereas this video looks at kind of affect and how it can link us together. Um, so yeah, maybe I can uh, explain, it's called prosody. Um, can I just see a show of hands of anyone who, I, I have not, Heard of Neither of us before. Heard this term, so. Like it's like so it's very specific, um, and I didn't even understand it in the little definition that starts the twenty-four minute long video. But um, prosody, I guess it's defined as how one modulates the intensity and rhythm of their voice while reading aloud in order to evoke emotion. Um, but how I really understood it is when I heard someone um, explain it like like how baby talk functions. So like a baby doesn't know language yet. A baby doesn't understand the actual words that you're saying, but it it understands your needs and what you mean based on how you're saying it. So this video is actually addressing like how we say something is sometimes just as important as what we say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it. Um, so the video is depicting three separate women. Um, can you talk about what, and so obviously they're reading, can you talk about what they're reading and why um, Cotter had them choose, or had them read this exact time? Um, yeah, he's, uh, he, he has each of these three women reading Rashida Madani's um, poetry. She's a Moroccan, she calls herself an activist poet, or I've heard her written about as an activist poet. Um, and she's actually one of the three women. Um, and so she basically, um, so she, I think I may have just mentioned she's Moroccan, and she comes, she kind of came of age in the, the Latin years. Um, so in the 60s and 70s, a lot of the intellectual community was violently suppressed by the government um, because of the power that they had. Um, and so she sees her poetry as political. Um, and in these stories, a lot of, a lot of it is about the, kind of the plight of, woman, uh, of women in contemporary society but it's through the lens uh, of a retelling of Sherazad. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with A Thousand and One Nights, Arabian Nights, some people know it as. Um, and Sherazad is the main, um, the storyteller and protagonist. Um, so it's a collection of stories, but there's this framework of her, um, Sherazad, who, I guess it goes that the, the Sultan, the king, 
is for some reason, I don't know if it was his wife that, that made him feel like he was, he was wronged by women. And so he has a vengeance towards women. And so I think he has some kind of con concubine or, you know. And so Sherazad volunteers because she wants to defend women. And what she does is she tells such compelling stories every night that he delays so the next night is the night that he'll kill her. Um, and that goes on for a thousand and one nights. So the, the story is in the poetry is kind of through a retelling of that. Um, so I think we can like, kind of loop back into this, um, into the larger themes around the show, um, and also specifically um, the, the place that we're in, uh, the Venus in Omaha. Um, so, you know, thinking about like the idea of the asylum seeker, like what was your sort of interest in bringing that here to the Venus? Yeah, so originally, um, originally the show was supposed to be much larger. Um, it was going to be about voice, both as vehicle of representation and acoustic material. Um, but then, you know, like these were two of the main pieces that I was really interested in, and they seemed linked to different things like storytelling and interviews, like I've mentioned. But also, I, I felt like it was a really interesting opportunity, particularly as I saw what was happening in, in our society at the moment, um, and also in Omaha. I mean, I think Omaha being, in 2016, per capita being the largest in refugee resettlement. Um, in my first show, I worked a bit with Lutheran Family Services, and hopefully we'll be doing some programs with them throughout the course of the show. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, their programs have changed dramatically because of our current administration's kind of squash on and, um, and I think it also uh, getting at certain ideas of um, benevolence and giving, and yeah, we can get into that one as well. Yeah. Um, so in your text, you kind of refer to this sort of so-called refugee crisis. Can you talk about why you frame it that way? Um, yeah, because I think this kind of, I don't know, I, I often take issue with the rhetoric of crisis as it's invoked in many ways, like economically or because it sometimes doesn't imply how long something has been in the making. Um, so I think the, the refugee crisis is actually due to these long processes of occupation, colonization, forced migration, um, trade, slavery. So I think Cotter particularly is getting at some of that history in his work. Um, and then I think, um, you know, going, thinking about the name of the show, I let them in, conditional hospitality, and the stranger. Um, what does that mean to you, and you know, why was that sort of the, the title that you wanted to, to use? Yeah, so um, I think, um, I, like I think I mentioned earlier, I was building on what I saw Visa do in Monarchs, which was an amazing show. Um, and I think um, I let them in is, is particularly an utterance. Like, you're saying, like, I'm going to I let them in. It makes you say that. It makes you complicit in that in a way. Um, and I wanted um, us to realize that as U.S. citizens, we're a part of this process, right? Um, and I also think that the show is not for refugees. It's not, it's in English, you know? I mean, it's not that refugees don't speak English, but it's addressing a very particular audience. Um, and then it also ties to hospitality, which... Um, so, you know, jumping on the hospitality, uh, can you tell us a bit about the framing of hospitality? You know, who's the host? Who's the guest? Um, when you say an ethics of hospitality, you know, what do you mean? And it is really interesting to have it at the Bemis, where we're obviously hosting you all right now, but we host people from around the world as artist residents, curators, and residents visiting artists. So, yeah, and I think I like that hospitality is something we all have a sense of in different ways. Um, and yeah, and it relates, it means many different things there. And I think I should say it in my lar larger show text. Most clearly it's the figure of the immigrant or the refugee, right? But then, I mean, I think I started out with the land recognition because like, well, are we also an unwanted guest? Um, and then I'm a guest, you know, I'm a temporary curator here. So there's many different dynamics, but I think also hospitality, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's funny, I, so I'm Persian and there's a very particular sense of hospitality where it's like uh, you go into someone's house and you know if you compliment something you know they'll, ba you, they'll basically offer to give you like they'll be like oh that that you know that rug is so beautiful oh it's yours I don't, I don't need it oh and, but you're never supposed to actually take it like that's part of the social contract right and like so coming here like I'm a New Yorker there's different you know I've 
traveled a lot in territorial residency, Southern hospitality, Texan, you know, like each, you know, there's different cultural norms. Um, and I think it's also, there's something coded in it. So you're not really always understanding what people are saying and whether you're welcomed or not. Um, but yeah, I think most directly, I talked a little bit about in the show's text, there's a philosopher um, who's also between um, France and Algeria, so I thought some of his ideas really interesting reading Carter's work. Um, uh, Jacques Derrida writes, um, he wrote this um, a, a series of lectures on hospitality, and his definition really made a lot of sense to me. And actually, I mean, it's worth noting that this was, he was writing about this um, um, post-World War, and that was really, you know, the idea of the refugee crisis coming out of the Holocaust, um, that's like to start for a contemporary refugee crisis. But how he talks about hospitality is he talks about it as like these kind of self-contradictory rules. So on one side is this idea of the idealistic horizon of hospitality. We want to be welcoming to everyone. Um, we we want to open our home up, our land up. Uh, but on the other side is conditional hospitality. So it's the expectation of reciprocity. You have to behave yourself if you're gonna be in my house. Um, it's also how many people can come and how long they can stay. You know, you invited that friend and they like end up staying in their couch for two weeks, right? Um, so I think it's an interesting way of thinking actually about like, you know, he, he says that there's this kind of the rub between the two, but then he also looks at the etymology of the term hospitality, which comes from hastis, which means hostility. So this idea of hostility being embedded in any act of letting someone in or not, um, and even governing your relationship with that person. Um, so if people feel compelled by the artwork um, to take action towards supporting asylum seekers, um, what can they do? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, I think there's been a shift in, in kind of locally what's going on because of the federal administration's um, policies changing. But um, um, uh, obviously I'm someone who likes words and text, so there's a bunch of materials at the front desk. Um, uh, so Lutheran Family Services, um, there's two organizations locally that do a lot of amazing work, Lutheran Family Services and Refug Refugee Empowerment Center. Um, and so um, I believe Lutheran Family Services will be doing an information session here, but they have folders that detail um, different ways that you can tap in. So it used to be um, that you could sponsor a refugee family, um, which you can still do, you just can't help them through the New York Settlement process because they're not doing that. And then there's all these other programs. So there's mentoring, so there's actually career advisement. Um, there's um, mentorship just in terms of cultural um, assimilation. Um, and then there's the um, ESL programs. Um, and of course, monetary donations are always welcomed. Um, and then also like so there's a number of, um, of materials and, and, and binder at the front desk, but there's also different reparations campaigns. Um, so the idea of um, the theft of indigenous land, what can you do around that? Um, so there's some information on that too. Yeah, please take a look at it if you're interested. Um, and we'll be scheduling some programming around that uh, in the new year. Uh, in the beginning of your curatorial essay, which is available at the front desk, if anybody um, wants to take one home, you have a personal statement. Can you talk about what this show means to you personally and why you've included that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, usually curatorial texts are written in a very kind of objective, impartial, um, maybe even, not all curators are, are historians, but art historians definitely write, write it in that way more. Um, but um, a lot of times these, I mean, our work is motivated by personal experience. Um, and I wanted um, to just kind of recognize that. Um, also in my statement, I, I wanted to recognize, um, yeah, I mentioned that I come from a family um, of Middle Eastern refugees. And I also, you know, I explicitly talked about this in relation to my first show, Sick Time. So this idea of um, uh, not seeing myself in institutions, but then choosing to work with them in them. Um, so a little bit of my background is that I went into art to study with Hans Hoppe, a German artist who kind of started this, this um, thing called institutional critique. Well, some people would recommend starting it. Um, 
And this idea of, you know, he very famously had a show at the Guggenheim Museum um, uh, scheduled where he kind of did a taxonom taxonomical um, photographic mapping of the two main slumlords in New York at the time. And then the Whitney canceled it because he was critiquing the kind of mechanisms of power. Um, and I saw art's potential to kind of help us reform our society. Um, and so I think in my statement, I alluded to that a little bit. Um, and I also, I think, I mean, I got into the field of art because I think, you know, what can happen in that sometimes symbolic realm obviously has effects on the world. And that's why I do work that's a little bit more politically charged in this way. Um, but I also think I was, you know, particularly responding to different conversations that have been had recently about the politics of representation and arts complicity in systems of power. Um, so here at Bemis, um, at the Whitney Museum, I'm not sure if anyone's followed, but um, in the past couple of weeks, um, a number of the employees wrote an open letter after finding out that one of the um, key board members, his um, company, supplied tear gas um, that was used at the U.S.-Mexico uh, border against asylum seekers. So just looking at the different layers of the system and how we can negotiate that. Yeah, and I always think, you know, as a curator also, um, you know, the artists are sharing their personal lives and work with us, and that's something that we're also doing as curators is, you know, this is something that I'm interested in being able to give a larger voice to, so I'm, I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I think finally, uh, you also talk about the need uh, as part of your own curatorial work uh, with these institutions um, to work with them to be, become more accessible. Um, can you say something, uh, you know, talk about the access note that we have, which was part of sick time, but then also um, email that we have uh, available and some other ways you've asked us to consider um, access? Yeah, and so, um, Forgive me if I'm, uh, if you've already heard me talk about this here before, but I just want to make sure everyone kind of understands what access in terms of accessibility means um, in relation to how it's often posted, at least on art organizations' websites. Um, accessibility. Um, we were just we were just talking earlier about um, uh, Bush Senior passing away and kind of conversations around the uh, ADA and accessibility at, um, uh, for people with disabilities. Um, and yeah, so access, you know, this is, uh, so basically it's often um, a note on an organization's website that refers to limitations to the built environment and um, kind of uh, willingness to work around that. Um, and so during my first show um, here, um, I asked Femus to implement an accessibility note on the website and at the door. So that's when we first kind of started the conversation which but with Davina and Chris. Um, and then in that, I was trying to look, um, this is often actually something I do as a freelance curator going in, because I have these conversations with organizations. So like I mentioned, I work in this uh, realm of institutional critique. And so for many years, I did this within, like as a, a, a staff curator, or, um, and then going from an outside, sometimes you're allowed to see things with a fresh perspective. Um, and it also just allows you to have a different negotiation. So um, coming in, it was like, you know, it was both about whether the bathrooms were here, wheelchair accessible, um, but also trying to look at things intersectionally. So, um, you know, starting to talk about whether um, like American Sign Language translation could be provided for certain programs alongside native foreign language translation. And um, so in order to kind of sense, and obviously like the thing is, is I am only a temporary guest in Omaha, so I don't know, been here long enough to kind of know what people need. Um, and even if you're here, you don't always know what people who aren't in your realm need. So we started the access email um, so that um, people can write in and either request support to attend particular programs or just kind of feedback um, in more expansive ways about um, what they need to see themselves at Bemis. Um, and so for this show, um, I, we had some conversations particularly an accessibility um, uh, beyond disability, but um, particularly in relation to race and ethnicity because of the show. Um, and uh, yeah, so we decided to kind of keep the access email going. And we also have an access feedback box at the front desk now. Right, so if you have any, you can do it on the spot. Yeah. Um, I think that we're gonna open it up for questions. So Chris is gonna bring this microphone around. It's 
since we're taping this. Um, hold on. Questions? about the videos, are they all the same as in the show? Are they all different? Um, so, uh, as I mentioned the, um, in the first... No, the right behind you. The the screen. Yeah, so the green. Oh, okay. So the green one is the, that's the one that I talked about that's right. in um, the, side the, the right side, um, so in the two rooms. So you're seeing the composite. Um, obviously, of the single channel video I mentioned in the first room, Julianne Moore and Al Baldwin, and then the six asylum seekers and refugees are composited in there that you see the videos in the second room. Um, and then this is not that an actual um, installation shot of what we have here um, on the left, because for the PR we put it out before. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, there's um, 18 um, chapters in different cubicles in the past version, but we're showing just eight, so that's what's in the other gallery. Um, and then this in the bottom is the third piece um, in the middle of that. So the women reading the poem? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's in the video room, so as you walk through the gallery that has the cubicles. There's a little arrow. And it's an arrow. interesting to know that both of these artists, I mean, I, I, I guess I keep speaking about where they're from um, and without have, like getting too much into the kind of like Algerian context or the South African context, but um, it is interesting that neither of them are American. Um, so I think Candice is particularly dealing with Hollywood, which is, you know, an American apparatus. I mean, it expands much beyond that. Um, but I do think it's interesting because identity politics and conversations about whiteness are different in from what I've seen and what I know are very different in the US than in um, other parts of the globe. Um, so, I mean, particularly Cotter's piece is not, like Candy's is particularly takes the language of critiquing forms of whiteness. Um, and so like, you know, just one example is this, the name of the piece, Love Story. So it's both about like love, like the, the labor of love that it takes to move oneself and one's family and, and go through this, this flight of migration but she's particularly referencing, I, I can't remember the actors, I think it's from the 70s, this, this, rom, the, this romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. or, um, but this whole tradition of the love story of the kind of, you know, the, the white photojournalist that goes to Africa and falls in love, you know, with an aid worker. Or, you know, this love story of these people under these kinds of very severe conditions. But it's never about the, you know, the, the other telling their story. Um, so it's understanding these plights, but only by reinscribing whiteness is, is how she talked about it. Um, and I think obviously in the gesture, she's making us you know, try to think about it. And in the, it is a provocative gesture. And I think when I describe it, I feel like it's so reductive that when you watch it, it's something very different. Um, and I think in Cotter's, it's, it's, he wouldn't use the language of whiteness per se. He, he talks about you know, kind of this Eurocentrism. Um, so, I mean, like, you know, colonization by the French of Algeria is very complex. Um, and so actually, I mean, I won't get into it too much, but, you know, like, uh, Jacques Derrida, a lot of people just see as this, like, you know, it's like using another white male philosopher to talk about your work. And it's actually, he's, he's Jewish, and he was treated in Algeria, it wasn't the same as the, the Muslim Algerians. Um, but so those, you know, obviously these things are always quite complex. Um, but yeah, I think um, in his piece, he's very much looking at these kinds of systems of meaning and even like, like the chapter on ancestors, how we understand our relationship in time, in Eurocentric time versus other senses of time. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Well, Karen is here. 
so if you want to come up and ask your question. Um, but we want to thank you again for coming, and please um, enjoy a drink and also go see some video. Um, and let us know if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Just you want to come up and talk. That's great too. So thanks again. Thank you.